Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, everybody. It is time for the Books That Make You Show, and I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. We're talking about books that make you learn that anything is possible, especially when life seems hopeless. The only path forward is to embrace life's journey and cross the desert. At age 16, Payam Zamani's parents paid smugglers to get him safely across 1,500 miles of desert so that he could flee brutal religious persecution in Iran. As a teenager, he arrived as a refugee in America with nothing but a dream. Then, 12 years later, he launched a record-breaking billion-dollar IPO, only for it to fall victim to Wall Street's meltdown over the 90s tech bubble. 23 years later, he brought back the company and returned it to profitability in just a few months. The story of Pam's extreme swing from oppression to opportunity and from financial heights to lows told in his book, Crossing the Desert, The Power of Embracing Life's Difficult Journeys. Payam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Desiree. I really appreciate it. I, I want to read this book. You made it sound so good. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay, number one, I have a special place in my heart for memoirs because they're, they're stories that are told from our real lived experiences. And that's so powerful. And when we overcome adversity such as yours, it even it makes it even more poignant. Can you tell us what it was like first at the stage growing up as a child in a place where people were persecuted for their faith? You know, it's interesting. As humans, we adapt to situations so easily. And it really takes taking a few steps or maybe a few thousand miles away to really understand that that was not okay. You know, uh, growing up, it was pretty common to see that at night our windows would break, uh, that people would just throw rocks for no reason. But the fact that the kids were incited by the uh, by the local mullah that the Baha'is need to be beaten and they need to be kicked out of our town. And then, of course, you know, uh, I mean, the most extreme uh, atrocity would be killing someone and hundreds of Baha'is were killed in Iran in the 80s. But, you know, I was only 10 and a half, 11 years old when um, I was expelled from school. And by expel, I don't mean that you just go to the principal's office and they say that, you will no longer come back to this school. I was expelled because I was a Baha'i and I was expelled by a mob uh, that beat me and another classmate who was also a Baha'i. And, uh, you know, for about a mile to our home uh, with the idea of killing us, um, they spit on us for a mile, you know, mob of 50, 60 people, you know, nonstop. So by the time we got home, we were drenched uh, in, in spit and bloody, we made it home. Uh, really not thinking that that was a journey that we survived against all odds we did. But I think that uh, when you, when I lived in that environment, um, you know, that's all I knew because I was raised even pre-revolution. It wasn't walking apart to be a Baha'i in Iran, uh, especially in small towns, but post-revolution things really changed dramatically. And that has to do so much to shape your spirit and your character and your outlook on life. Do you want to talk about how that influenced you as a human and who you are? Yeah, you know, uh, growing up, I was always told that crises are followed by victories and victories by crisis. Uh, you know, when crisis hits you, don't feel despair. You know, know that that will pass. And when you're experiencing victories, know that, that will not last either. This cycle will keep, you know, going. And that, that's a cycle of life. Um, so I think that that's what it taught me the most, that knowing that as bad as the situation may be, A, it can be a lot worse. Any situation can be a lot worse. And B, this shall pass. 
and know and have faith that there is something great on the other side. You know, I really believe that the bigger the crisis in life, the bigger the victories that will follow. So when you have big crisis in your life, be excited because big victories are about to follow. There's only one catch, and that is when victories happen, they're typically what I call life moments. And you got to recognize them because they happen to you, but you got to know that that is happening to you so you can grab it and take advantage of it and get the most out of it. And you're, you're keying into something that I think is really interesting because sometimes when people feel beaten down, they get mm-hmm. discouraged and it's hard for them to recognize that opportunity. They might look at an opportunity and see it as a threat. In your experience, how did you have the tenacity to recognize because, and we haven't really gotten to who (laughs) you are today, but I mean, you've taken that tragedy and that life experience and just flipped it upside down, not once, but a couple of times. So how can people, do you think, recognize it and understand that this is something that they should look forward to and take advantage of? You know, we don't really have choices often. When the crises are hitting us, well, they are hitting us. And what am I going to do? Am I going to feel, um, you know, despair? Am I going to be depressed about it? Or am I going to feel like, you know, regardless of if it is fair, unfair, just, unjust, whatever the reason, I'm not going to let that define me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna become a victim of that. Whatever that that may be. The way I see it is that in the road of life, there are obstacles, and they're inevitable. But that road is never blocked. So I want to get through those obstacles, but I don't want to look at them as 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 blocked roads because I can always find a way find a way around them, jump over them, go under them, whatever that may be the case. But you got to look for those little opportunities that will allow you to get to the other side. And how does your experience and your understanding of the world, how does that influence how you Mm. understand the American dream? Yeah. So, of course, growing up a Baha'i, I was, I was, born into optimism. As Baha'is, we believe that there is this wonderful uh, stage that humanity is going to reach, regardless of what's happening right now, that a new world order is being built, regardless of all the challenges that humanity is facing. So I think that optimism uh, definitely drove me. But I always also tell people, now we're in the US, so I can talk to my fellow Americans (laughs) that, you know, When I was that teenager in Iran that I was getting beaten up for being a Baha'i and also we were getting bombarded by Iraqis, uh, you know, during the war, eight-year war, there was one country that gave me hope. And I hate to say it, but it wasn't Russia or China. It was the United States that gave me hope. Because at the end of the day, I felt that there is a country on this planet that stands for a level of goodness that no other country matches. Now, I, I get it. We have problems, partisan politics, materialism, on and on, racism. But at the end of the day, I got to tell you, uh, when, I, when I think about that teenager in anywhere, in Mogadishu, in anywhere in the world that is dealing with atrocities, I guarantee you there's only one place that gives that teenager hope, and that's the U.S., And um, to your point, I don't think that teenager could have achieved what you have had you emigrated to China or Russia or take your pick of any other country in the world. And I think as Americans, sometimes we do lose sight of what has made us great and what continues to make us great and that we are still a beacon of hope for people all around the world. I think that's really, really powerful. No, you're absolutely. The hope that this country represents to the world is a privilege we are born into. And that privilege, I think, is something that we should be excited about. That's a spiritual destiny that as as a country, as people who belong to a country, we represent so much to the world. We're not just another country. You know, we represent what's possible. Again, you know, people see the problems we have. But they realize that those problems also often, 
don't define America. America ultimately represents an idea. And, you know, it, are we perfect? Far from it. But the idea is that we have that North Star that we want to work towards. And um, so as an, you know, growing up in Iran, I knew the cities in Iran, but I knew almost every state in the U.S. and the capital of every state. I had a map on my wall because even though I'd never visited the U.S., that was my second home even back then. It's like somewhere deep inside you knew you knew what your destiny was going to be. And yeah. I just want to say, too, for the folks who are not so familiar with the Baha'i faith, um, the show broadcasts in a multitude of places. We're on a station that is run by uh, somebody who is of the Baha'i faith, and that strongly influences the programming of the radio station. We're also on YouTube and other platforms as well. So would you take a moment and, and you touched on it a bit, but describe the philosophies and what it means to be a Baha'i? You know, uh, as, as Baha'is, we believe that religion is very personal. You know, you you uh, pray personally and connect with God personally. You read the writings for yourself, and your interpretation of the writings are good for you. No one else can interpret the writings for you. Um, to me, the Baha'i faith uh, means many things. But one main thing that it means is that I need to love humanity, and I need to not basically see any distinction between races, genders, and, and on and on, all the stuff that separate us. Um, you know, there's one God, so there's only one truth. So as a result of that, I should really think about what unifies us and not our differences. And um, so over the years, I think I've really have been fortunate that, you know, I was able, despite the atrocities in Iran, to be able to build that foundation, have the opportunity to get closer to, to my faith, which teaches timeless spiritual values that everybody from all religions, frankly, accepts, which by the way, makes sense because there's only one religion if there's only one God. But the point is that when I came to the US, it was, it was for the first time that I felt that not only I can practice my religion, but I'm also able to actually allow those values um, uh, show themselves and show up in my work, in my everyday living in a way that in many other places, particularly in Iran, that could not have happened. Yeah. And I just got to say from my personal experience, I've ex I visited a lot of church, churches and mosques and religious places. Uh, one of the most powerful experiences and most welcoming experiences I had was when I was in India and I visited mm. the Baha'i Temple there. It was beautiful, sure. gorgeous, and just there is this sense of unity. And like you say, it, it, for the Baha'i, it's often very personal. And how you choose to believe is something that is instilled in yourself. Um, and I think that somehow seems to some folks, that that almost seems like a threat because there's this sense of this is the way it's supposed to be done. Mm. You're supposed to follow it this way. And there's certain rules and um, creeds that people are expected to follow. I think it's interesting when you talk about spiritual capitalism, because now you've combined a couple of concepts here that usually don't seem to go together. Can you talk about spiritual mm -hmm. capitalism? I know it's funny because when I use that term, spiritual capitalism, many people do reach out. They say you cannot combine the two because capitalism is bereft of anything good. And I don't see it that way, frankly. I think that uh, we have human-made systems in the world. And of course, they're imperfect. And that's okay. That's part of our experience. Um, and, uh, but the concept of spiritual capitalism to me, all that means is that business is not just business. Business touches people, business affects people. If Amazon decides that I'm, we're going to open up this now, and we're going to own this portion of the market, it has real effect on main street businesses and people and entrepreneurs because they may be going bankrupt. So business is not just business. So if that's not the case, what values? should be incorporated in making business and elevating business to something that can serve humanity and not just serve the pocketbooks of a few. 
And I call that spiritual capitalism. I basically, I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is that there are these spiritual values and qualities that we go to churches, synagogues, and so on, and we pray about that are so near and dear to our hearts. Those spiritual values that come to mind when we raise our kids. Why shouldn't they also play a role in the way we build our businesses? And I remember there was there was a there was a moment in time that I had this like wake up call, and that was uh, I saw the director of a nonprofit called Tahrir Justice Center. Uh, the founder director Lily Miller. She spoke at this conference, and I remember thinking that why is it that nonprofits stand for humanity for the betterment of the world, but for profits? stand for greed. Why can't we blur the line? And I don't mean, um, you know, a business that cannot find this path that is almost profitable, but not really profitable. And it's kind of like hiding behind the fact that, well, I'm trying to do good in the world. Well, but you're not doing either. And I'm talking about businesses that are truly good businesses, but they choose to have those values uh, as part of their fabric. And by that, again, I don't also mean just a slogan on the wall that says integrity is important to us. No, I mean that it's part of your fabric. And I'll give you an example. Today is uh, a Baha'i Holy Day, and we have about 260 employees in our company. And But today, all of our employees in 11 different countries are off. It's a Baha'i Holy Day. But now, keep in mind, 98% of them are not Baha'is. They're off, but what they do today as they do on all Baha'i Holy Days, is that they serve humanity. However they see fit is up to them. We ask them, there's one thing we ask them not to do, and that is to not serve a political party on these days because they are, they are disunifying by nature. But that's an example of how you can at least make an attempt uh, to, to incorporate values into your everyday work. Now you had a billion dollar IPO. When you talk about moments, that had to be an amazing moment for you as a business person. Can you describe how that felt? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I started my book with that. Um, and uh, it was, you know, you think about this 28 year old who has been poor almost all of his life. And uh, even while I was building the business, I was poor. And, um, uh, you know, we, my brother and I, we started the company on our credit cards as that's all we had. So we were in debt uh, most of our lives. And um, so when our company did have uh, a public offering uh, in March of 1999, it was a very surreal experience. We had built a business out of passion we had. We were entrepreneurs and I loved entrepreneurship. And the business came out of that passion. But we frankly, at least at the beginning, did not think that we we're building something that could become what it became. And uh, so the day that the company went public, uh, that's when it hit me that uh, life will not be the same. And in both good and bad ways, frankly, uh, in, in a bad sense, because very quickly I learned the flaws of the capitalism system. Uh, that that we live in and we experience. And those flaws uh, were just massive. They're huge. And then also on, the, end, on the, uh, the other end of the spectrum, it was very clear to me that I would get treated differently. And, and I experienced that very quickly. Um, and then, of course, a lot followed. Uh, a lot followed that were both massive ups and downs. Um, but it was definitely an experience that has uh, shaped uh, many aspects of my life today. I would say that a few things that have shaped my life, uh, there is no question that escaping Iran uh, shaped my life in a, in a massive way. Um, clearly starting a company, taking that public, uh, but also uh, then the kinds of things that we all experience, like you know having kids, you know getting married, well, getting married comes first. And then having kids, uh, but but th that definitely uh, that IPO shaped my life in in many different ways. Uh, it wasn't about the money because I lost almost all of it. Uh, it was more about uh, how I really had a passion to use my spiritual uh, values and play a role in the in the capitalism system to see how I can be of 
you know, ever so slightly, but a bit of a positive influence in it. And when you talk about flaws in capitalism, because you're mm. right, and there's probably a lot of people who are like, you know, capitalism is terrible. Yeah. I, I just don't know of a better system that, that they all have their flaws. But what would you change? How, how mm. do you want to challenge capitalism? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we have often heard that they say the system is rigged mm -hmm. and it is rigged. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a simple fact. Um, there are, I don't know how many billionaires in this country now, but there are a lot of them. And it seems like, you know, we're having more and more all the time. Almost exclusively, all of the billionaires come about as a result of appreciation of the value of their stock. Meaning that there are very, very few billionaires. Frankly, I cannot name them because I don't know who they are. Uh, that they became billionaires because they generated actually a billion dollars in cash flow. So that actually can be a bit of a problem when you become billionaires from the appreciation of stock, because it's by far more difficult to build a business than it is to make a stock price go up. Stocks can be manipulated in many different ways, but businesses cannot be built as easily as stocks can be manipulated. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my company went public and we saw that, oh my God, we priced our stock at 14. A day later, it was worth $50. Now, frankly, I was terrified because it's not like I could sell any shares. As a founder, I'm locked up for six months. But who's not locked up? Wall Street is not locked up. The VCs, most of them, at least what they bought at IPO, they're not locked up. Later on, what we found out was Credit Suisse First Boston, that was the bank behind our uh, public offering. They had done side deals with many of the uh, buyers of the stock, major buyers of the stock, that if I sell you at 14, you will buy also at 28 post IPO. So they had guaranteed themselves the uptick in the stock, why would they do that? Because every time you have a public offering, the bank gets about 5% of the offering at the original price. So if the stock price goes up to $50 and the original was 14, they get to benefit from $36 a share without risking a dime. They make tens of millions of dollars. Now, this became a class action lawsuit because Credit Suisse First Boston had done this with hundreds of IPOs. And it became a multi-hundred million dollar settlement that Credit Suisse First Boston had to, uh, you know, the, the companies were not at fault, the bankers were. So it is, it, 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 that's an example of how the system is broken because it is driven by greed, breadth of any spiritual qualities and values. So I think that the way we're gonna change it is, Forget the concept of business is business. It's not. We need to bring those spiritual values that we know make us happier into our workplace. In my case, my spiritual values are inspired by the Baha'i faith. But it doesn't matter. Ultimately, they're the same spiritual values. I want to see them combined. Yeah, uh, I do too. It's amazing because you're underscoring the greed that's behind a lot of things. And we're living in a world right now where there's just so much going on between artificial intelligence yeah. threatening to replace a lot of jobs. The human factor seems to be diminished more and more. Is that something that you feel and see as well? Yeah, and, and that, is, uh, that is a concern. Uh, now, having said that, as I, you know, the, the, the tagline for my company is, innovation plus intention. Because mm -hmm. when people bring up, for example, AI, should be afraid of AI. And my answer is, I don't know. And the reason for it is, I'm more afraid of the innovator and not the invention. Because the invention simply represents the values of the innovator. And um, so if those values came from a place of service to humanity, elevating business to serve humanity, making the world a better place, any innovation, including AI, can only serve us and help us become better. But the problem is that intention. Absolutely. It's a tool, how we use the tool, That's how right. we use a hammer to build a house or to smack somebody. That's all the intention behind it. Absolutely. 
I want to go back. We have a few minutes left. Let's go back to Iran, if we could. You experienced statelessness. <laughs> what insights can you share so that people might understand today in the world, those who might be experiencing statelessness? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I was in uh, France uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I remember thinking for a moment, if I did not carry this U.S. passport, and I did not carry Iranian passport, so if something would happen, I needed to go to an embassy. What embassy would I go to? Who cares about me? Who would worry about me? There are a lot of people like that in the world. And we don't appreciate that. And, you know, it's interesting. There, there are two types of immigrants in the world. There are those that are immigrating for economic reasons. And there are those that are immigrating because they're escaping something that's going to harm them. Those who are leaving for economic reasons, they got to follow the laws. They got to follow the rules. They got to they gotta respect the rule of law and borders and so on. But if you're escaping harm and you make it killed, well, uh, wh wherever you're going to, they need to realize you don't have the time to wait and apply for something and then see when they're going to respond. You just got to cross that border and then figure it out. So I think that those two need to be, they need to be treated differently and handled very differently. I think today, at least in the U.S., we're combining everything in one uh, big of a mess. Uh, but statelessness is something that uh, people who are, uh, who are facing, uh, it is a very uh, desperate situation and it is not easy to get out of that situation. Now, there's a part of me that I want to give them hope, but unfortunately, I think that the host countries of the world, Western countries for the most part, uh, they are shying away from offering the safe haven that they used to offer. You know, there are, I know, thousands of Baha'is, for example, stuck in Turkey because the U.S. is not willing to accept them the way they did before. So that, you know, I like to give them hope. And there are aspects of my story that gives them hope. Uh, but the fact is, it is a very challenging and dire situation when you see people die in boats crossing the Mediterranean trying to get to the other side. Um, it shows how desperate the situation is that they see that as a safer path than staying behind where they are. And it seems like humanity is not really caring in a meaningful way. So I'd love to give hope, uh, but I feel like that hope needs to be backed by real action by the powerful countries of the planet. And your book indeed does inspire hope. And I know it, it feels so hard because you have major countries of the world doing things differently and attitude shifting. Again, the world is in this just spiraling state of flux. But what is it, Param, that you want people to take away from mm. your book? What do you want them? What's the one thing you want them to walk away with after they read it? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the, the thing that always come to my mind, and, and the reason I wrote this book uh, was primarily to communicate the fact that those challenging moments of life, those crises, whether they're in personal life, they're in business, uh, they're because they're dealing with your government, whatever they may be, they are uh, launching pads for a better version of you, for a more impactful version of you. Recognize that and realize that, that that is your future makeup is being built and that is going to make you a better human being. Don't shy away from it. Absolutely. Do not shy away from it and do not shy away from your book. Can you tell folks where they can go to find the book, find out more about you. Give us your details, please. Sure. Here's a book. It is now available for, it's going to come out on June 18th. It's available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and all major stores. And um, you can find me uh, on all major social media, um, uh, on Instagram, Payam Zamani, no space, no hyphen, uh, LinkedIn, the same thing. And uh, uh, please uh, reach out. DM me if you want to chat. Oh, I love that. I love how approachable, accessible, how genuine, and how amazing you are. This has been you, such Dr. an incredible interview. Thank you. Thank you. 
And thank you everybody for being with us as well. Again, my name is Desiree Duffy and I invite you to join us on our website, booksthatmakeyou.com. Uh, once you're there, you can subscribe to our Webby Award-winning newsletter. That way you never miss out on fabulous interviews like we just had or find out more about news in the bookish world. We do lots of fun giveaways. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and on YouTube. Make sure you ring the bell, subscribe. Um, that way you're always tuned into all of the wonderful interviews that we have. Until next time all of my bookish buddies. Please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddhi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises. 